Good afternoon. It is 323 Wednesday, October 2nd. This is the TDN Writers Room podcast. I'm Joe Bianca, Associate Editor at the Thoroughbred Daily News. Steve Shirak, um, Senior Editor at Thoroughbred Daily News, been here since 2003 and happy to make my podcast debut today. Jonathan Green from uh, DJ Stable and also a partner at the Green Group, uh, Tax and Accounting Consultants. Brian Dignato, Racing Editor at the TDN and Managing Partner of Franklin Ave Equine. Yeah, good. We mentioned it this time. <laughs> so we had a big weekend of racing last weekend. Uh, last weekend, this weekend, we're really going to get a clearer picture of the Breeders' Cup. Uh, obviously, the headline, I would say, is Vino Rosso's DQ in the Jockey Club Gold Cup with Code of Honor. I think I tweeted after the race that it was the worst disqualification I'd ever seen in New York. I'll back off that just a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to say it's it's the worst big race DQ I've ever seen in New York. And my issue with it was, you know, the bumping I think happened at a, at a time that it wasn't crucial to either horse's momentum. It was kind of outside the 16th pole. And then after that, any contact I think was, was pretty mutual. And I don't think it affected the outcome of the race. And it's just, it, it put a sour taste in my mouth because I felt like Vino Rosso dug in so gamely throughout the stretch in that race. And I thought Irad actually ran a really great race being aggressive out of the gate. And I, I tweeted before I saw the DQ that he, he won that race on his own. So I, I it kind of left a sour taste in my mouth, but also like just watching New York racing on a daily basis, that stuff is never punished. That right. kind of hurting is really, it, especially with the Ortiz boys, they like to, to herd horses out and I hardly ever see it punished. And just to do it in a big race like that, it, it just didn't, it, it rubbed me the wrong way. You know, I, I didn't really have a, a dog in the fight, but it's just, it's tough to see the stewards decide something that razor thin and both horses ran great and it was a great horse race. And it, it just, it didn't seem like the way to decide that result. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? hundred percent agree with you on everything you're saying there. I think the biggest issue I have with the stewards one day, it seems like it could be a DQ another day. It seems like maybe it's not. And the grade one race really wanted to come down to the horses. It was such a great horse race coming down the stretch. I didn't bet a nickel on the race, so to be upset about it is kind of <laughs> surprising about me. I don't know what if you guys had a vested interest in anything, but it's just one day it seems like it's a different answer. And a grade one, you want that to be decided on the track and not in the stewards' booth, in my opinion. And I think you're also talking about consistency, whether uh, in any sport, whether you're talking about balls and strikes in baseball or now with the new pass interference rule in football. Um, and, and, you know, this also transcends into our industry where you want to have consistency and whether it's a 10,000 hour claiming race or a grade one race. Um, the other thing I was a takeaway from from that race, guys, was that, uh, you know, Todd Pletcher actually took the blinkers off, you know, Rosso um, in the race before the race. And you have to wonder if he's kicking himself after that, um, saying, oh, gee, right. if the horse was, you know, right. lug, lug, lugging out a little bit, and that's why maybe if he had the blinkers, he just would have been focused that just a little bit more, um, and therefore it wouldn't even be an issue. Um, in any sport, I think you want to keep it out of the hands of the officials. So maybe if that horse just had stayed course with the blinkers, um, that he would be the winner. But I think just like the Kentucky Derby, everyone assumes and understands that uh, the best horse, you know, won the race, even if they weren't actually pronounced the winner at the end. And I definitely agree that I would never have taken that horse down. Um, and I kind of think Code of Honor hung a little bit. Like he, he ran a great race, but he had every opportunity to go by. He never really broke stride or anything, so... I would have left it up. Yeah, that was my issue with it is that it didn't seem like he his momentum was ever stopped or he was knocked onto his wrong lead or anything like that. I think he did he did hang and they both ran a great race, so I don't want to be too critical of, of Code of Honor, but I agree with you that he had every chance to go by. And that bump like the bumps that were Vino Rosso's fault, I think happened at the sixteenth pole or earlier, whereas everything after that I felt like was was pretty mutual and it just it stinks to see such a great race decided by the stewards. And, you know, it kind of goes to what we talked about. I don't remember if it was last week or the week before. There's just there's very little transparency and there's no there's no official explanation, at least in the NFL. When the guy goes into the, the booth for a little bit, he comes back. He'll usually give you a reason. Or if he doesn't, he says the, the call stands. You assume mm -hmm. that that means there wasn't enough evidence to overturn it. But at least someone is forward facing and has to explain it. And especially now that they have the, the the referee expert in the booth every single time. So you at least get a, a clearer picture of what the refs are looking at there. In the stewards room, it's just it's so vague and it's so far away from everybody. And it's just it doesn't I don't know, it, it doesn't lend itself well to thinking this was 
this was a well thought out or well, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly what's DQ worthy and what isn't when you never get an explanation for anything. I think the, the jockeys involved, if you switch jockeys on the two horses, I think the result may be different. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think Johnny V comes down if he's on. If you don't That's another that thing. Yeah. I think they play favorites. Being DQ'd on a lot of Santana horses the last couple of summers, <laughs> I feel like they pick on him, and I feel like Irad gets picked on a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. How I about think, Johnny V objecting against the Clutcher yeah, horse? Against guys, yeah, yeah right. that he took off of as well. Yeah. It was such a... I yeah. mean, you can't blame him. I, yeah, you he did do what it, he had to do, and right, he just has that respect from everybody. And mm-hmm. I honestly, set, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say you just set the record for the graded stakes wins, and he gets the respect of everybody. And I just that that it just I think we all agree of how frivolous the call was. Mm-hmm. But if he was the one, if it's the other way, it just seems like maybe it doesn't happen. Yeah, and it was it was one of those things where I was watching it at home. And I saw like one head on and I, I walked out of the room because I asked nothing. And then I come back and I see Johnny in the winner's circle. But uh, there was no there's not going to be any appeal, apparently, from the owners of Rapoli Stable and St. Elias, from uh, the, the owners of Vino Rosso. So I guess they're going to let this one go. I think it is an interesting dynamic, like you said, with Johnny claiming foul against a Pletcher horse. Right. Uh, the other news to come out of that race is Code of Honor. It was a little iffy for the couple days after the Jockey Club Gold Cup whether or not he was going to run in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Earlier today, Shug McGahee confirmed that he will be running in the Breeders' Cup Classic. And it just, I think that he had done enough regardless to win the three-year-old championship. I would have voted for him even if he hadn't been put up in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. I do not have a vote. Let me just make that clear. But uh, hypothetically speaking, and he... He's done enough, I think, when it really matters the most. You know, Maximum Security, he had his chances earlier in the year, and he did well. But Code of Honor, when you put together the runner-up finish in the Kentucky Derby, the Fountain of Youth, the Dwyer win, the Travers, and now beating Elders in the Jockey Club Gold Cup, I think it's going to be tough for anyone to dethrone him. But why not? It's a $6 million race. Why not try to to put it to bed? He also mentioned that they're kind of going for the Horse of the Year trophy as well now. And that's I wanted to lead into that a little bit because we talked last week about how interesting it was to have both a filly and a turf horse as the main contenders for the Horse of the Year trophy. It's not usually that way this late in the year. And Code of Honor, I think he's he might have a little bit too much to do unless he wins the Classic. Then it's a totally different discussion. Mm-hmm. But... There was another horse, another horse of the year contender who ran well and, and won on Saturday in Midnight Bizu in the Bell Dame, and she just put another notch in her belt. And her main competition, it seemed, before Saturday was Bricks and Mortar. So Bricks and Mortar, I think, is in a little bit of a tough spot here because he is not going to have a prep race before the Breeders' Cup, and there's no Breeders' Cup race that I think really hits him between the eyes distance-wise because I think I think Chad Brown would agree. I think most people would agree that he's best – going between nine and 10 furlongs. You don't have that in a previous cup. You either have the mile or the mile and a half classic. Sounds like Chad is leaning towards the mile, which is probably a little short for him. So what do you guys think? Do you think that code of honor can do enough to usurp bricks and mortar and midnight Bizu or is did midnight Bizu kind of come close to locking that up on Saturday? What do you guys feel? I think it's pretty close right now. I think I want to see code of honor win the classic. If I'm going to consider him a horse of the year. I just want to see more on the resume and obviously with these controversial DQs that he's been involved with too, kind of may sway voters a little bit. Maybe then he doesn't get as much credit as he should then, but going against a horse like midnight be suit. Now you got three grade one, seven for seven. These horses don't seem to run campaigns like this anymore. She's a bit of a throwback. Even looking at her from last year, she hasn't had any time off really either, but she seems like a clear cut front runner to me right now, but I'd love to see either, Midnight BC or Bricks and Mortar take a shot in the classic and then really kind of put your stamp mm-hmm. on it. But either of them have had brilliant campaigns and with the three year olds and older horses all being up in the air, I feel like you kind of you have to look somewhere else at this point. I think a I think if Code of Honor wins the classic, I think I'd give it to him. And I think if Bricks and Mortar won his race, I'd give it to him. But I think Midnight BC is kind of the leader in the clubhouse and assuming that she wins the distaff, I'd probably give it to her. But I think, you know, I mean, the Breeders' Cup decides it every year pretty much, but I think especially this year it's so murky at this point that I think that'll, a lot's riding on uh, the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, and if you're looking at history to give you a guide of what the future is going to be, um, in the past 50 years, um, you know, we've had five Triple Crown winners. In the past 50 years, do you guys know how many Phillies were named Horse of the Year? Can't be more than a couple. Three? Three? Two? Two? 
Two. Okay. The answer is six. Really? Wow. There are actually six. So there are almost as many fillies uh, that have won the Horse of the Year as, as Triple Crown winners. So mm. that'll be that'll be our, our stump the stud question of the day. We'll have to get some theme music for that. Um, but no, there have been six, and and uh, and, and it's the, the names that you recognize. But interestingly enough, they're all older mares um, that have done it. It's uh, Harv the Grace, uh, Zenyatta, Rachel Alexandra, Azari. Lady oh, yeah. Secret. Now that I look at the list, yeah. Lady Secret, and all along, <laughs> these I mean, are recent. You, so they have no excuse not to remember these. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd recognize them, but but it is you know even over the past fifty years, I mean it's one every decade. Okay, so you know you have to say to yourself, um, the, the the deck is stacked against uh, Midnight Biso, and and is she good enough to be a once in a decade kind of filly? And I'm not sure she's quite as brilliant as you know when you look at the names. Agreed. On that Agreed. List. Yeah, she's, and also the. the the other ones you mentioned, like Rachel Alexandra, Harvard de Grace, they beat males. Right. That was a key thing. I mean, Ibisu has stayed with her own sex throughout the year. So I, I, I think that is, is going to be factored in that she didn't really step out of her comfort zone. But the consistency, I think, is what she has in her corner. No question about it. And I think if one of the two or three favorites for the classic end up hitting the uh, the wire first and actually winning, not getting too cute, and actually mm-hmm. winning um, and standing in the winner's circle, you would think that the the odds would be that they would also be horse of the year. It's just a natural progression for them. Um, and, and it's patterns like anything else. I remember when we were going for the, for the Eclipse Award, um, this past year with, with Jaywalk. And, uh, you know, people were, we were nervous because newspaper of record was equally as impressive on the turf um, as we were on the dirt. And people kept saying, no, no, you guys won the Breeders' Cup, therefore the dirt race, therefore you're going to win the uh, the Eclipse Award. And you're never quite sure until the, the votes come out. And I think the same thing would hold true here. If, if you get Code of Honor or even Bricks and Mortar to end up, you know, hitting the wire first, um, you would have to think they'd be the favorite going into the, uh, going into the awards dinner. Even McKenzie, I mean, he's kind of been on and off a little bit and he's disappointed in a couple spots but i mean if he goes and wins the breeders cup by five he's got to be in the conversation i would think yeah I'm, I'm sad that bill's not here by the way bill finley uh our intrepid reporter is sick today so that's why he's not on the podcast so a lot more room for the rest of us to talk today i think <laughs> I agree with that um but i was uh, sad that he wasn't here because we had a little bit of a, a, a debate about mckinsey and matoli because i feel like matoli has a pretty strong case for older dirt mail, mm. and I kind of wanted to poke a little fun at him that McKenzie lost to a son of high tail on Saturday at Santa Anita. And you know that's why Bill's not here. Just, he didn't want to <laughs> take a ribbing, me. right? He's yeah, ducking exactly. me. That, exactly. That, oh, man. Um, but, yeah, I think Brian makes a good point in that this year especially, it feels like the Breeders' Cup is is especially momentous in terms of deciding these championships, and I think that's that's what you want at this time of the year because nobody, nobody's going to duck anybody. Everybody everybody that's in the conversation is going to show up and, and, and bring their best race and – I think that even after the Breeders' Cup, it might be a little fuzzy. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the next month or so. Um, one more race I wanted to mention from, from Belmont on Saturday. I really thought one of the best races of the year was Imperial Hint and Forensic Fire in the Vosburgh. You know, I it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Midnight Bizu, a late clash in the personal ends in which I think was the race of the year up until that point. I just thought it was it was a really interesting race because Forensic Fire seems like a totally different horse at Belmont. Oh, yeah. You know, he, he's run other, he's run good races at other tracks, but when he, he shows up at Belmont, man, when I'm thinking, I think back to that Dwyer race last year when right. he took that flood of late money and ran away. So he he's a different animal there. I was surprised that a guy only like a 103 buyer, mm-hmm. you know, 108 and one over a track that didn't seem particularly fast. I thought it'd be much higher than that, but a really, really gutsy effort by Imperial Hand, who was another one who's been a little bit of an in and outer this year. He's had a couple of dull efforts, but it seems like he's back on his game now. So I just wanted to give a shout out to those those two for putting on a show in the Belmont stretch on Saturday. It was nice just to see it decided on the track. We talk about the Jockey Cup right. Gold Cup and seeing a number come down after a, a great horse race, and this was just two really nice horses throwing down. Maybe Friends Fire hung a little bit too. I don't know if that's too too critical of it, but just Imperial Hint just ran right. such a monster race, and it was great to see. And I'm surprised too with the number. He got a 114, I think, in the Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just to see it come back that light. But, I mean, you don't want to read too much into that, though. But definitely looking forward to seeing him back in the Breeders' Cup. I loved him in the one at Del Mar a couple years ago. He ran a winning race and just was second best. But yeah, we'll see. I definitely like shipping out there. At least Churchill maybe wasn't his favorite track. But exciting horse for the rest of the year for sure. Let's go to Brian on Imperial Hint. I will say I'm a little bit against Imperial Hint in the Breeders' Cup. It seems like he kind of needs his races spaced out. Um, he's kind of famous, famously a, a tiny little horse. Um I don't know. I just I have a feeling he's not going to run his A race in the Breeders' Cup, but I mean, he's 
really one of the coolest horses in training. But. Definitely, yeah. And you got to love, like, the small connections, oh, yeah. having a horse Absolutely. like that and running them and just, you know, run, yep. running them in every top spot they can find. Everybody, Anybody else want to say anything about the weekend's races while we're here? And, yeah, Santa Anita seemed, like, terrible to me. It didn't really seem like anything interesting. Okay. You know what? I did want to make one point about one horse in sure. Santa Anita. Um, one horse I'm looking forward to betting out of the races at Santa Anita last weekend, Bo Recall. I've been following her since she's come to America. Brad Cox, have just he's done such a tremendous job with this filly. I don't think she wants to go the the distance of the filly mare turf. I'm dying to see her cut back to a mile, take on Colt to make one big run, get a pace to to run at finally. She's going to – I think she could run a huge race in the mile. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm looking forward to. Price. Yeah. All right, um, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna move on from last weekend. There's an interesting new feature that we're running, new series we're running in the TDN called "What Would You Fix First? And we had uh, we have a, have a industry stalwart every day trying to figure out what the most pressing problem, what they would do if they were in charge of racing on day one. Basically, uh, we had Craig Burnick the other day talk about the need for Equibase's data to be free and accessible. Kenny McPeak talking, I, I, th- I thought it was a good point about the, uh, the, the signal distribution issues and, where, you know, some states don't have ADWs or it's impossible to set up one. It's just I agree with both of those. So I wanted to open this up to the floor, and we're all opinionated guys here. We're all big racing fans, and I wanted to see if anybody had any passionate pleas for the racing world if they were in charge. I think it's kind of scary. Of how, if you ask 20 people to answer this question, you might get 20 different right. answers. And that's, that's <laughs> very frightening to me no. right there. Mm. My whole thing is public perception right now after the whole situation at Santa Anita. Headlines in the New York Times justify justify failed drug test before winning Triple Crown. Obviously misleading of once you get to learn the whole story. But I think the cleaning up the drug testing has to be maybe the, the biggest issue right now to me. That there just needs to be more money vested into it. You need to start weeding out cheaters. People need to start, you need to start making an example out of people to kind of give us some faith in the public eye again, maybe. And just the state to state, the different medication rules everywhere. It's a very complicated situation, but there, I feel like that at least maybe could get us on the right track with the general public. If you start cleaning up your own house, start catching some people that are doing some stuff wrong, at least start there. But I mean, it's, like I said, I think 20, you'll get 20 different answers from 20 different questions. And, and Steve, I concur with, with the consistency rule, especially. Um, we race in, in seven different races, in seven different states, I should say. Um, and, you know, the trainers have to actually think about medications yeah. that they're using on the horses, even if it's therapeutic medications, um, literally 28 to 30 days in advance. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, it really kills your flexibility um, of, as far as where to run or, you know, can you run in this race or an extra just came up in this race or this race came up light, you know, with only three horses in it. Do we want to try to run for a grade? And you're almost, um, you know, you're almost at a, at a complete disadvantage if you're racing in right. a different jurisdiction. So consistency is, yeah. is huge as, as, a, as a racetrack, a race horse owner, I should right. say. Um, I concur completely. I've got to uh, take out, I think, is obviously a huge issue. I mean, I got into the game as a horse player first and foremost, and I think if you were coming in fresh now, you'd be crazy to, to, to start trying to teach yourself how to handicap and yeah. start betting races. They're just, I mean, there are better ways to spend your time uh, that are a little more beatable. Um, and I just don't know how we're going to compete long-term with fantasy sports and sports wagering and all that and poker and all these things. Um, and my other one is, condition book stuff and entries I think kind of the most eye-opening thing for new owners is you think okay we're scheduled to race this day we'll enter and we'll get to run and it really doesn't work that way it's it can be very frustrating especially for new owners and I think there are probably some better ways to manage the horse population and find spots for horses no question so so are we changing it to what would you fix first and entry and 1a one and 1a is that is that, is that concurrently is they're it? from different different sides of is, things is so. this like you know when the genie comes out of the lamp and you say i'll give you three wishes my first yeah, wish is for 100 are, more wishes is that is that, is that, is that, like that. okay um no but I, I think your point is is well taken especially for for people who are are uh, you know new to the game where they talk to the trainer and the trainer says your horse is going to run on saturday and and we'll right. see you there and they invite all their friends and they get dressed up and and all of a sudden the day before you know they get the 
email or the call from the trainer saying, no, they uh, they didn't use the race. What do you mean they didn't use the race? Mm -hmm. We've been pointing for this. So it, it is a frustrating part of the part of the game. And that also blends into what Steve was talking about, medication. The good right. news is, the bad news is we can't run in New York. The good news is there's a race in Maryland um, that hopefully they'll put off right. for another couple of days right. so I can right. get, you know, this therapeutic drug out of our system. Um, but no, excellent points, uh, you know, on, on what would you fix first. I'm going to a little bit uh, darker side of, of the industry on what would you fix first. And it's a, it actually, uh, you know, um, rang true when I was just down at the Keeneland September sale. And, you know, for many parts of this industry, there's a licensing procedure. If you want to be a trainer, you have to have a certain amount of uh, racetrack time. You take the test and then you're, um, you know, you're, you're held up to a certain standards. Jockey's the same way. You get an apprenticeship, um, you get your license, you get an apprenticeship, you get to be a full-fledged jockey and, and the likes. Um, owners, you have to be licensed. One aspect of the industry where you do not have to be licensed at all is to be a bloodstock agent. So you can literally put an ad, uh, you know, on the internet and tout yourself as a bloodstock agent, and you have no fiscal or fiduciary responsibility to your client. Now, just think about that. You are basically managing their money, and you have the ability to buy horses based on your expertise and your say so. But you do not have to disclose things to this client, like. By the way, I own a piece of this horse and I'm touting you. Or, by the way, um, you know, there's a really nice horse in, in, in the sale that is being sold by XYZ Consignment. And then you go to XYZ Consignment and say, how much do you think you're going to get for that horse? $100,000. Okay, if I guarantee you that you get $200,000, then you get the hundred, and we split everything above 100000 Those deals happen oh, yeah. more regularly. I mean, I'm getting a lot of head nods. You know, you see it. And, and yet there's no... Um, fiduciary responsibility, and it's completely an unregulated sector of the industry. So if we're trying to encourage people to come into the business and buy young horses um, at a sale and, you know, in encourage them to spend their money, spend their time and their expertise and want to get involved, and right off the bat, they are being turned over and and taken advantage of by these, by these agents. Not all agents. There's just a handful of unscrupulous agents, but there's no way to govern it. There's no consistency. There's no transparency. Um, and these agents can kind of run roughshod over, over, you know, these new owners that are coming to the business or old owners. Um, you know, we're, we're not, uh, you know, we're not, uh, divorced from, from that immediate situation, but it, it's, to me, it's a travesty that new people who come into the business that want to do the right thing and want to spend the money the right way, um, don't have a chance to get a return on their investment because they're getting, um, brought down a primrose path by these, uh, agents that have, no disclosure regulations whatsoever um, involved in that. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's it's so deregulated? I think it's I think it's just a um, a part of the industry that um, you know that that isn't under anyone's jurisdiction. Um, the jockey club has a registration under their jurisdiction, so that's why you know with this 140 mare proposal um, cap, you know they have the right to do that because it's under their purview. Um, the racetracks and the states all have their jurisdictions to you know, mandate certain um, you know criteria to become a licensed uh, individual, whether it's trainer, owner, or jockey. Um, or even backstretch employee. But the bloodstock agency is still the Wild West. There's nobody policing it at all. Um, and, you know, Brian and I are down there at the, at the sales and, and, you know, we represent in, and are spending other people's monies. Um, and thank goodness that, that at least you have a, have a conscience and you can't, uh, you know, do things unscrupulously yeah. for, for your clients. Um, and, and therefore, there's, you know, they have a chance to at least spend their money on a horse that may be worth that money. Um, the industry's tough enough as, as it is, you know, with horses getting hurt, getting sick, um, not performing, um, getting DQ'd. I mean, there's all kinds of hurdles that they have to overcome. At least give people an opportunity to spend their money the correct way and, and not feel like that they're just getting turned over just because somebody else can make a quick buck off you. Brian, do you have any thoughts on that? Um. <laughs> Edit if that not, that's fine. If not, it's fine. You can just yeah. move on. Well, let me just let me just give you an example yeah. of, of of kind of an unscrupulous situation. Um, and again, you can we can we can always cut this out if it gets too long. But mm. um, so just an example of that is you know an agent who would come in and say um, you know like I said before, he'd buy a horse for a hundred and 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 buy it before the the sale. Um, another example is to go back to a consigner and say my clients are interested in your horse, and if I get them to buy the horse, can I get a five percent commission? For that. And it's up to the consigner at that point to say, yeah, you're nay. And a lot of them will say no, but there are enough of them out there where that will say yes for it to be a common practice. 
if the consigner says no, then what does the agent do? Well, the agent then goes back to his client and says, hey, remember I was touting this really great horse for you. Well, um, I, you know, parenthetically, I can't tell you that I wasn't getting a commission and that's why I'm off the horse now. So I'm going to make something up and say the horse didn't vet. Right. Well, now that rumor mm -hmm. of the horse not vetting gets around the sale. And all of a sudden it's, well, wait a second, I like that horse too. So it didn't vet? Well, now I'm questioning my vet. Or I'm looking at the x-rays really closely now and saying, what did we miss? What, as opposed to, I'm going in and I'm buying this horse with complete confidence because I didn't hear that rumor. That was basically a lie mm -hmm. um, that was set up because the, the agent had to save face in front of his client. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Nothing good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I agree uh, with it all. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's why I would fix first. All right. Okay. <laughs> Got you. Um, yeah, all that is a, a little bit above my pay grade, but I just wanted to follow up on on Steve's point and it's how it's just kind of taken for granted in racing that there are certain trainers that if they claim off another trainer, the horse is going to be an entirely new horse. And then, you know, vice versa, if you claim off certain trainers, you're expecting the horses form to plummet. And I just, it's such an accepted part of racing that you kind of don't even, don't even really think about it. But when you actually do think about it, like this is, this is kind of morally an abomination and it happens every day, you know, in the claiming ranks, horses get dropped that, and as a better, you you kind of you kind of look for these opportunities of a horse that's dropping down. And you have a reason to believe the horse isn't going to run its top race. But I just think that's the kind of thing that is is a little bit of a black eye that every single day in racing, someone's trying to get rid of some horse, someone's trying to claim another horse, and you know, move it up however they can move it up. And I, I think that's a big problem. Just the public perception, like you're saying, and I'm saying, you get even at the day to day claiming races, but now you're seeing guys move horses way up and then it's a grade one race. And then so many trainers too. I don't want to name names, but you think you have a race one at the eighth pole and this guy's horse always seems to re-break or get second wind getting kind of tired of seeing stuff like that too. And I just feel like if you're on Twitter or social media, social media, you see people just going crazy every time one of these horses wins, Yeah, somebody comes up the ranks and it's just, the public perception just couldn't be any worse in my eyes. I will say Twitter has gotten a little out of hand with the conspiracy theories. Yeah. We had a horse enter. Wait, really? Twitter's gotten out of hand? <laughs> <I mean, laughs> sound the alarm. <laughs> we had a horse in at Saratoga. So there's a big conspiracy theory that the two Ortiz brothers kind of like, yeah, yeah. I don't know, playing they the chop races it up beforehand and yeah, somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we had previously ridden Jose Ortiz on a horse. We got spun. We had IRAD on. And people started messaging me, Oh, you know, asking me, like, can you explain this as if, yeah, we just <laughs> handed in our chance to win the race to, yeah. for some kind of conspiracy or whatever it was. Um, and then Jose ended up getting back on the horse anyway, so it didn't matter. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there are two sides to all that stuff, but there's definitely a public perception issue. Yeah, and just as a handicapper, too, it, it is frustrating. You know, at certain times you feel like, you know, if there's a certain trainer with a certain, you know, sorry. It's just from a handicapping perspective, too, it feels like sometimes if there are certain trainers in a race off the claim, you don't even want to play. You know, you don't even you don't mm -hmm. even bother because do you trust the horse or do you not? And if you I mean, if you do trust the horse, the horse is going to be over bet. It's just it's you kind of get sweat in circles a little bit here trying to handicap the, the trainers. And just upsetting the betters who I think are obviously in the big equation of the most important people in the sport. You want to keep them as happy as possible. Yeah, We're all yeah. betters, too. And. You just you keep getting rubbed the wrong way in certain races like this. I don't know. Some people might have tougher skin than me, but at yeah. some point you're just going to be frustrated, like you said, and either just pass the race or maybe you start betting less races, maybe you just start betting certain kind of races, but right. it's just nothing good is going to come out of it, basically. Yeah. John? No, I think, I think you know, without again, without naming names, you can look at racetracks and you can say, why would you ever bet at Monmouth between the takeout and between, you know, the train, the two trainers that dominate there? Um, there's never any value there mm -hmm. that you can never really, once the last time you saw a horse that, that, that won at, you know, 20 to one, or, or, I mean, I know statistically it's not as common, but there are reasons why it ha doesn't happen at, at those, you know, other racing venues. Yeah. Monmouth is a good example too. Cause we're, you know, our, for those who don't know, our, uh, our headquarters are in Red Bank, New Jersey, like 10 minutes away from Monmouth. So it's the kind of track that I would like to support you know, as, as the local home track, but it's just unbettable. You know, it's like 49% winning favorites. Like you said, two trainers win everything, maybe even, maybe even two jockeys like Paco and Nick Juarez 
basically dominate everything. And it's just, it's not a good product. And at the end, it, in the end of the day, it kind of goes to what Brian was saying about take, take out. If you don't give people a good product that they feel like they have a reasonable chance to make money on every day, they're going to stop betting. And I don't think I bet, other than maybe Haskell Day, I don't think I bet a single dollar at Monmouth all meat. And that's, that's unfortunate because I would like to support them. But I just, you know, you have to make fiscal decisions in every part of the business, owner, trainer, horse player. It's just a shame that Monmouth really could be considered maybe a top five racetrack in America just based on aesthetics and how it looks when you spend an afternoon there. It's a great atmosphere. There's people there. There are young people there. People are excited about the races. But just like you guys, I'll go to Monmouth. I'm sorry, Monmouth, but I'll bet Saratoga. I'll bet <laughs> Man, what any, other, rough. any other track. But I, it's, it's one of my favorite places to mm-hmm. be, though. I love the place, but just the product comes down to the product, and it just doesn't – small fields and just like what you guys are saying, it's just not, not a good way to spend your money betting, at least for me. Mm-hmm. I play Monmouth a lot, but it's always on the Betfair Exchange. That's yeah. all I do. That's the only way to get an edge, I feel like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, for me, it's, as far as the what would you fix first, this is kind of it's, – it's not super – I'm not hyper-focused on any one jurisdiction, but I just think there needs to be less racing and, 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 and fewer tracks and more consolidation. Like, for there to still be, like, 20, 25 tracks running on a daily basis – you look at some of these tracks and especially the mid Atlantic, I think is a good example where there is just, it's so clustered and there's so many tracks running basically around the same time, basically competing for the same horses. It just, it it leads to short fields, which again, waters down the betting product. And I I just, I don't want to take aim at anybody in particular, but I just think in general, there is too much racing in America right now compared to the demand. I think there's, there's oversupply and I just, I don't think it matches up with how many horse players there are, with how many horses there are as the full crop keeps, keeps declining. I just think there needs to be, and again, which is, a lot of this goes back to the lack of coordination and racing and the lack of a national unified, you know, jurist or commission or whatever. It just, there's no, it, it's, there's very little, you know, coordination and very little, um, I guess, cooperation, I would say among these tracks and among these States to, create a better betting product because eventually people are going to get sick of this, these short fields and these favorites and these cheating trainers. It's just, you know, it's not, it's not, it it doesn't bode well for the future. I don't think. I think we'll, it's going to kind of naturally, I think we're going to continue to see tracks close and, you know, full crops maybe go down. (laughs) You know, I hate to say it as, as young people in the industry, it's not what you want to see or want to expect, but I think the consolidation is kind of a trend that we'll continue to see, but maybe it'll kind of find its, equilibrium and we'll kind of get to the right spot yeah and i i think you know in in new york in the winter you know i love aqueduct i I grew up going to aqueduct but for them to only take like what 10 days off for the entire winter it's just again it's like it's an unbettable product most of the time and i think there might be other fixes for that too i think maybe uh, installing a a synthetic track for the winter so you can keep those turf horses around those cheaper turf horses instead of either them going away for the winter or going down to gulf stream so there are other fixes there but it just needs to be less racing, man. That's just that's the way I feel. All right, um, we're gonna we're gonna touch on this weekend very quickly. There's I think like something like 17 graded stakes. Oh, wow. There's like there's maybe 14 on Saturday alone. Uh, this this is the last hurrah for everyone who wants to earn their Breeders' Cup winning in spot. Um, so there's too much I think to go through and, and and preview. So I just wanted to open it up to you guys and you know just. I want, I want to know what you're looking forward to most this weekend. I'll, I'll kick it off because I don't want you guys, any of you guys stealing what I was going to do. But um, I, I, I'm interested in the first lady stakes on Saturday at Keeneland because I love a good old-fashioned East Coast, West Coast showdown. Going back to Tupac and Biggie. This is, um, <laughs> this is, this is, uh, this, this is the, the equine version of that because you got Rushing Fall and you got Vasilica, two complete win machines. Rushing Fall, 8 for 10, I think, lifetime and and – Basilica obviously has been a terror since being claimed by Jerry Hollendorfer. And it's a big field. There's other horses in there, too. There's 14 horses. Coolmore has got just wonderful shipping in, who's, who's I think, on the rise. And Uni's in there as well. So it's it's by no means just down to those two horses. But I just love I, I love that clash of coast kind of angle, and I'm, I'm interested to see who comes out on top. I'll stay at Keeneland on Saturday. We still haven't had the benefit of seeing what Belmont's doing Saturday yet, but I'll stay at Keeneland with Joe there, and I'll look at the Claiborne Breeders' future already. Anytime you get... Two big field, the two-year-olds going two turns right before the Breeders' Cup is always exciting. And last week in the TDN, I did a story on Gouverneur Morris, who was super impressive first out at Saratoga. Granted, he won in the slop, and I'm always a little skeptical, kind of 
horses that freak first out in the slot, but maybe he could give eight rings and Dennis's moment a, a run for his money if he proves up to the task going two turns the first time. Drew outside. He's got to overcome that, but yeah, yeah he, he looks dangerous. Drew the 10, yep. I'm going to go with a trainer angle instead of a specific horse or a specific race, and that's uh, Mark Cassie. Uh, Mark has no less than six horses in winning your in races this weekend. Um, most of them are at Keeneland. And uh, I know from talking to him a couple of days ago, he was very excited about the, his opportunities he has with these with young superstars that are working their way up the ladder. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be, you know, with a keen eye watching Mark and to see how uh, how his horses um, compete over the uh, over the weekend. And, and what a phenomenal weekend for racing four weeks ahead of the Breeders' Cup. I mean, this all the ills that we were talking about of what we want to fix. This is the right thing mm -hmm. in, in racing is having uh, all these wonderful races. Um, and ironically enough, just as we were talking of the past. 30 seconds the uh, overnight came out for Belmont um, so I'm also from a uh, Homer standpoint I'm also going to be watching a thread of blue which is our horse in the uh, Hill Prince the, the grade two on Saturday you also have another miracle is that this weekend or the following weekend good question another miracle is actually on Sunday okay Sunday. Um, and that's a win and you're in as well mm -hmm. so uh, you know hopefully the rain will hold off because we have two important turf races coming up uh, mm -hmm. you know one going uh, nine furlongs and the other going six furlongs mm -hmm. well, good luck thank from you appreciate here, from that. all of us here at the team <laughs> you guys are awesome thank you um Back to Steve's point about the two-year-old race, uh, and I, I think the New York race kind of, both of those together, I think the, we have two really, really good two-year-olds who are now going to the Breeders' Cup in Dennis's moment and eight rings, and we have a, some pretty good Colts who could join them and kind of make it an even better than, it looks like a two-horse race now a little bit, but, I mean, Governor Morris, the, the Mark Cassie horse to have it to win, both in the Keeneland race, Green Light Go might still be the best uh, East Coast three-year-old or two-year-old uh, three technique. I know Jeremiah Englehart was really high on, and he was flattered when uh, one of the horses out of his maiden breaker came back and won nicely on Sunday at Churchill. So, I mean, that could shape up to be a really, really good race. Yeah. Another one uh, in there, the uh, the Brendan Walsh horse, forgetting the name at, at the moment. It's uh, Maxfield. Maxfield, yeah. Broke slowly past everybody going a mile first time out at Churchill. I thought he was an interesting horse, especially stretching out to two turns here. So is he like is he like the Snoop Dogg of of your analogy? Is that <laughs> I gotta come up, I gotta I gotta work on this and come up with as, as many uh, rapper analogies as I can. Uh, we're trying to we're, we're trying to reach the younger audience as well here at the TDN. Um, I had one horse I wanted to also mention on Saturday last race at Keeneland, um, a first timer named Further Lane who I sold at OBS April for one hundred and seventy thousand. My comment is OBS April monster. We love this horse. She was out of our price range, but I think she's. Brad Cox has her. I'm sure she's not going to be a huge price or anything, but I'm looking forward to see her debuting. Yeah, and just for those who don't know, uh, Brian has has dived head first, has, has has gone head first into two year old racing and two year old breeze sales, and he really he works hard at this and takes notes on pretty much every breezer. And I remember last year, the year before, when you were taking notes on every two year old race. I watched every horse in every two year old race for like. <laughs> three months and then Saratoga came around I mean, and that's, gave up on it. That's pretty remarkable. So, uh, so yeah, definitely when, when Brian has, has an idea about a two year old, you should listen to him. Thank you. I hope this one works. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And just to follow up on, on what John was saying about this weekend, I agree. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be too negative. So I, I think it is, it is worth noting that this is this is this is what it's about, and this and like the next coming month up until the Breeders' Cup and the anticipation. I think there are a lot of good things in racing still, and it's just there's a lot to fix, you know. And that's everybody's got a stake in it. You know, everybody's everybody should have an idea, and everybody should should, you know, be pushing towards the same goal, which is making racing more palatable to everybody and a fairer game as well. No question. Even over the past you know ten years, I think that. Overall, the industry has done a really good job of being very introspective and saying, okay, we can't just keep our head in the ground and expect that people are going to come out and bet their money and, and also buy, buy our horses. Um, so there have been some regulatory uh, you know, changes that have been for the better. It seems like that now there's going to be more and more transparency, whether it's through you know, the racing game uh, side of it or through drugs um, or through the, uh, you know, hopefully through the, the sales side. Um, but the first, you know, the, the first recognition, the first, uh, you know, solution of, of fixing a problem is recognizing there's mm -hmm. a problem. And, and even though there may be 20 different things that we can come up with, um, as long as there's solutions that, that are, you know, um, accompanying those, then I think the industry is going to be better in the long run. Yeah. And I think, uh, this is kind of an inflection point because of the, the negative attention that's come from Santa Anita. I think this is a chance and I, I think it, it could be a blessing in disguise long run because safety, drugs, like these are all things that I think 
have been overdue to be addressed in racing. And I, I think it's unfortunately maybe taken a tragic event or tragic happenings to get people to be more realistic about this. But I think in the end, it could be a good thing if we turn this the right way. Any other thoughts? The one good thing I will say for as negative as things look, just even you guys were talking about Keeneland September before, just the gross is the last two years of mm -hmm. top five kind of 360 million. I forgot the number 377 was the year before, but people are still spending money. People are excited to spend their money and bidding against each other. And from a betting standpoint, it seems like there's still a good audience that likes to, to play as well, but that you just have to focus on some things to fix, obviously, but just seeing the, the gross at Keeneland is obviously kind of makes everybody calm down. It's made me calm down at least in saying that <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe it's not as gloomy as you think it is, but there are things that need to be fixed and need to be fixed in a hurry. Yeah. And, and just, uh, want to hammer Brian's point about takeout too. It's, it's, I, I, to me, that's easily one of the top two or three most important issues in terms of Re retaining fans and gaining new fans is the younger betters are more and more sophisticated and they have more and more options, you know, than they used to, especially now with sports betting becoming legal and tracks out there. People notice when you cut takeout and people notice when you hike takeout. And we've seen like the, the, the horse player boy boycotts from Churchill when they raised the takeout it happened to Keeneland about a year or two ago. So people are very sensitive to this kind of thing. And me, me too. When I started playing races, I didn't really pay attention to takeout at all. I would just bet Belmont if it was in front of me. But now I'm like exclusively, a, almost exclusively a pick five player because I think that's the best value at 15% mm -hmm. as opposed to these 24% pick four takeouts. So people, people notice. And if you want to retain these fans and you don't want to give in to the, the, to the miserable conspiracy nuts <laughs> on Twitter, then give, give them something to be happy about. You know, people, people will, will reward you for it. But Joe, I thought takeout only matters if you win. <laughs> no, it, that's what I learned. It matters in the long run. Yeah, you can't, um, win. You can't win at the current takeout rate. There yeah, probably there are very few people in America I think that win. It's difficult year. for sure. That's a good thing we had the financial expert here to tell us <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always here for you. All right. Um, so that's it for this week. A much shorter podcast without the uh, dulcet tones of Bill Finley, but hopefully we'll, we'll have him back next week. I want to thank Steve Chirac, John Green, and Brian DiDonato. We'll see you next week. <laughs>